Hey everybody, and welcome to Frontend Expert. This video will be the introduction to the HTML crash course. HTML is one of those weird topics in software engineering where it is assumed that we all just somehow magically know it, even though it is rarely taught in any schools with any real depth. However, there actually is a good bit of complexity and nuance to the language that can set a strong front-end engineer apart from others. So the goal of this crash course is to do just that. We will start with the basics of the language and all of its terminology. Then we will look at some of the deeper components such as semantic HTML and accessibility. While it is true that modern frameworks oftentimes abstract away portions of HTML, it is still the foundational language of how the internet functions. At the core, a front end of a web page is just an HTML document, regardless of that abstraction. All of these frameworks eventually must produce an HTML file that can be given to the browser. This means that to develop a deep understanding of the front end, we must also have a deep understanding of this basic building block as it will affect nearly everything we do. For example, as we use JavaScript to add functionality to a page, knowing how that page is structured and how the browser is keeping track of it can help us understand the pros and cons of different approaches that we might take. Moreover, since all of the content displayed on a web page comes from HTML, the use of proper semantic HTML is incredibly important in building accessible web pages that will work regardless of the assistive technologies that different users might be using to interact with the page. Now, on the interview front, you likely won't be asked to just implement a basic HTML file. That said, it is incredibly likely that you will be asked to write some JavaScript or even CSS to interact with HTML, and these styles of questions will become far easier with a strong foundation in HTML. Moreover, you might be asked different quiz style questions about the language, and this crash course should help you feel prepared with high quality answers to those questions. And of course, some of these questions will come up in our own quiz on Frontend Expert that you can use to assess your readiness for this style of question. And with that, I hope this video gave you a good idea of why HTML is so important in preparing for front-end interviews, as well as just becoming a stronger front-end engineer. So with that said, let's get right into the rest of the crash course, and I'll see you in the next video. Hey everybody, and welcome back to Front-end Expert. In this video, we will be talking about the basics of HTML, going over what exactly it is, how we can use it, and what the syntax will look like. So HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language, but we can break that down a little bit further. So hypertext simply means text with links, or hyperlinks as we call them. These are links from one document on the web to another. And a markup language is a language used to annotate some kind of content or text. In the case of HTML, we will annotate the content of our web page just to tell the browser what everything is. For example, we will need to differentiate between a heading and a paragraph. And I think the best way to understand this is to look at an example, so let's take a look at one now. Here we have a blog post titled My Blog Post, and it has two sections, day one and day two. Maybe we were on some sort of two-day adventure and we wrote a blog post about it. Well, we as humans can look at this and just understand what everything is. We see that there is a heading on top and two sections below it. But a browser can't do this, so we need a way to tell it what everything is, and we do that by annotating it. So at the top, we have my blog post, and this is a heading. Specifically, this is the primary heading of the page. Then we have the text for day one and day two, which are also headings. But rather than being the primary heading, these are subheadings, or headings with less importance. And then below each of these subheadings is a paragraph. We could even get more specific and annotate things like which paragraphs are associated with which headings. But for now, let's just stick to describing what each piece of text is. But that does bring up a question. How do we actually make these annotations? What does that syntax look like? Well, we use a syntax known as a tag. And a tag is just that. It's an annotation for content in HTML. So if we had some text, say hello world, for example, and we wanted to annotate this as a paragraph, we would use the paragraph tag, which is represented by the letter P. So a tag takes its name, in this case P, and it wraps it in less than and greater than signs, oftentimes referred to as the angle brackets. 
So on the left-hand side, we have the opening tag with less than, p, greater than, and then we have the content. In this case, it is hello world. And finally, on the right-hand side, we will have the closing tag. The one difference here will be that we need to add a forward slash before the tag name, but after the less than sign. This forward slash is simply to indicate that this is a closing tag. And now this is a completed annotation. And we call this combination of the tags and the content inside of them an element. In general, most tags are going to follow this format. But there are some exceptions, and these are known as empty tags or sometimes called self-closing tags. These are tags that don't have any content, and because of that, we don't include a closing tag since there would be nothing for it to wrap. So let me give you an example. If we look back at the blog post from earlier, we had two different sections of content. But what if we wanted to put something as a break between the two sections? We call this a thematic break usually, and we have a horizontal rule tag for it, or HR. Visually, by default, this just draws a horizontal line across the page to break up the content. But this tag has no content itself, so there's no reason to have anything inside of it. This means that there's no need for a closing tag, and thus we have just an opening tag. However, this can be a little bit confusing to read sometimes because you might see a tag and not know if a closing tag is coming or not. As you get more familiar with the different tags in HTML, you will learn which ones are empty tags and which ones are not just naturally, but we do have a different syntax we can use to make this a little bit easier. So what I will do is remove the greater than sign from the end, and then we add a forward slash after the tag name, and we have a space character between the two. Then we can add the greater than sign back in at the end as well, and this does the same thing as the other syntax, so either is perfectly fine to use. That said, it is just a personal preference, but you should try to be as consistent as possible. You don't want to go back and forth between syntaxes in the same file, because that can make things a little bit confusing to read. Now there's one final component to HTML tags that we should know about, and that's attributes. Attributes are a way for us to pass extra data to tags that will change the way the browser interprets those tags. You can think of these as similar to function parameters in traditional programming languages. So for example, what if we wanted to make a checkbox? So this is a simple box that the user can click on and it shows a check icon. Well, to do this, we use the input tag to signify to the browser that this is a user input. The input tag is an empty tag, but it's fairly generic and it's used for all kinds of different inputs. For example, we could use it for a text input or a date picker input. And we will see a variety of inputs throughout the crash course, but we need a way to specify that this input is a checkbox. And the way we can do that is with an attribute. So attributes go inside of the opening tag, or for an empty tag like input, it goes in the only tag that we have. And these attributes are going to be key value pairs. So we start with the attribute name, and in this case, we want the type. Then after the attribute name, we have an equal sign, and then the value as a string with quotation marks. So in this case, we want a checkbox, so we have the type is equal to checkbox. Then we just close out the tag like normal. And this will tell the browser that we don't want just any input, we want a type of checkbox. Now, there are a ton of different attributes for different tags, and we will see more throughout the crash course, but don't feel like you need to memorize all of them. You should be familiar with some of the more common ones, and that will come naturally as you work with HTML. And for the less common ones, it would be pretty unreasonable to expect you to have ever memorized all of them, so usually you can just look these up. Okay, so now that's pretty much all there is to HTML elements, but there is a bit more about HTML that we should know. First, let's look at comments. Just like comments in other languages, these allow us to leave a comment in the source code without affecting the output. So the browser ignores any comments when rendering the page. These comments look pretty similar to tags. We have a less than sign, and then an exclamation point, and then two dashes. This opens the comment, and now anything after this will be part of the comment, even if we go to a new line. Then finally, the comment will end when we have two dashes and a greater than sign. Now finally, let's discuss white space. White space refers to any space characters, such as spaces, tabs, and new lines. And white space is interesting because it is largely ignored in HTML, meaning that any white space we have will be collapsed into a single space. 
So if we look at these two paragraphs, we have this is text and this is text with new line characters. You might expect the one on the right to display with three lines. However, they would actually look the same in the browser output because of the fact that those new line characters will be treated as a single space. And while this might seem unintuitive, it's actually very useful because it allows us to indent our code as we nest tags and to break up long lines of text to keep our HTML easy to read. All that said, there are still ways to get around this if you ever do need white space to be displayed on the page, and we will see more about that in a future Crash Course video, but for now, just know that white space is largely ignored. Okay, so now let's put this all together and look at a complete HTML file. There's going to be a bit of boilerplate that we need for creating an HTML document, so let's start with that. The first line of every HTML file will be something known as the doc type. For this, we have a less than sign, then an exclamation point, and the word doc type, usually in all capital letters. Then we will say HTML and the greater than sign. The doc type simply tells the browser that we want to use the most modern version of HTML. Technically, you can specify different doc types if you want to use an older HTML version, but we rarely ever need to do that. Next, we will open the HTML tag, which is going to be the root of the document. And this is going to contain all of the other HTML elements as its content. Specifically, the HTML tag will always contain two tags, the head and the body. The head is there to hold any metadata about the web page. So this is information not shown on the page, but it is still important to the browser to understand how to render the page. Then the body is going to be the complete opposite of the head. It contains all of the elements that display on the page, including all of the ones we've looked at so far. So in the head, there's one tag that is always required, and that is called title. This does exactly what it sounds like. It gives a title to the page. Browsers typically use the title for the name of the tab that you are currently on, but they can be used in other places as well, such as search engine results. Now we can move into the body, which is where we have the actual content of the page. Here we could add a paragraph of hello world, just like we saw earlier. And once we close out this tag, we will have a completed HTML file. So we could give this file to the browser and it would understand it. It would know that this is an HTML page with the title of my blog post, and it would know that the only content to display on the page needs to be this paragraph that says hello world. And with that, that's going to be the end of this video on the basics of HTML. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next one. Hey everybody, welcome back to Frontend Expert. In this video, we'll be talking about semantic HTML. When we talk about semantic HTML, the question we're really trying to answer is, does your HTML file make sense without the browser? There are tons of circumstances where somebody might need to see your HTML code or interact with it, but they can't visually see the output produced by the browser. We need to make sure that the code we write is semantically correct for these purposes. For example, when somebody's using a screen reader, they won't be able to visually see how the browser displays things, and we need to make sure that the HTML is semantically correct. That way the screen reader knows what to tell that user. While we've already seen that we can use tags to appropriately mark up our content, we need a way to show what content is associated with what other content. We need a way to group them together. And that's where these semantic grouping tags come into play. So let's look back at that example again of the blog post we had. When you look at this visually, there's essentially three main groups. First, we have the day one group, the sort of first section of our blog post. And then we have the day two group, the second section of our blog post. But then above that, surrounding both of these groups, we can call it the third group of the entire blog post. The entire article is one group, and we need to make sure that all of this code is associated with each other as well. And when we go to tell HTML about these groups, there are tons of different tags that we can use to semantically mark it up to explain what type of group it is. So here are some of the most common ones. First, we have the article tag, and this is for self-contained content that is independently distributable. And what we mean by this is content that you could take and put somewhere else on the internet and it would still make sense. For example, a news article would make sense on lots of places on the internet most of the time, 
not just on the one website it's on or in the one place on that website that it is. Next, we have the section tag. And the section tag is very similar to article in that it is for a thematic grouping of content. But the primary difference here is that the section tag is not independently distributable. You couldn't take a section and put it somewhere else on the internet. Sometimes we see sections as sort of subsections of an article, so nested inside of an article. And other times sections are completely independent of articles, just to show different sections of a website that are each independent thematic groups of content, but that are not self-contained and that could not exist without the other sections. And from here, a lot of the semantic grouping elements get less ambiguous, which is really nice. They become easier to figure out when exactly you should use them and their names are fairly obvious. So first we have the header and the headers for introductory content. You can think of this as like the heading of the website, the description or tagline of the website. Sometimes this can include the navigation links if those are all sort of bundled together in one header component. And then next we have main, which is for the main content of the website. The one key point with main is that there should only be one of these on the website because it doesn't make sense to have two main pieces of content. And this is really useful, especially if you have a more complex website with a lot going on and you need a way to tell these assistive technologies what they need to be focusing on. You could imagine if somebody was using a screen reader and they were being read out all these different pieces of content, it would be super overwhelming on these complex websites. So having the main tag makes it more clear what they need to be focusing on as the main content of that page. Next, we have nav, and nav is simply for a section of links. So the most common use case is the main links of the website. Oftentimes these are inside of the header, but not always. And nav can sometimes be used for other sections of links, not always just the main navigation. Sometimes you have some sub navigation. For example, if you had some buttons at the top of a news article to jump to certain portions of the article, that could be a nav. But then you could have another nav that is the main nav at the top of the page that is for going to different pages on the actual news publication site. And next we have the aside tag and the aside tag is used for things that are indirectly related to the main content. And I like to think of this as any content that you can remove from the document without making the document confusing can be in an aside tag. Usually these tags are used for content in sidebars, but that's not always the case. Sometimes it is just some aside information inside of some other content on the page. And then lastly, we have the footer. And the footer is for, just like it sounds, the footer of the document. And this usually contains things like the copyright info and all that information that you see shoved at the bottom of websites in that footer bar goes in the footer tag. Now I think the best way to understand how to use these tags is to mark up some content ourselves. So here we have Algo News and there's a news article here. And at the top, you can see we have some navigation links as well as the name of the website. We have this about the author section on the right. And then at the bottom, we have some information about copyright. So to mark this up from top to bottom, first we have a header because this is the introductory content of the website has the name of the website as well as those navigational links. And speaking about the navigational links, we can mark this as navigation or use the nav element to surround it because these are the main links of the website. These are the links that will go to different pages throughout the website. So it's sort of a section of links that are important. Next, we have this about the author section. And this is sort of a side content because we could take this content out of the document and it would still make sense. You could still read this review of Algo Expert without knowing who the author is. It's nice to know who the author is to see if it's something you can trust, but it's not necessarily information that you need to be able to read this article. Next, we have the actual article. And of course, we can use the article tag for this. And the test that we had was, could we take this article and put it somewhere else on the web and have it still make sense? In this case, it's an article reviewing Algo Expert. And I think that would make sense just about anywhere on the web or at least in other places on the internet. And then finally, at the bottom, we have this footer information, the copyright info and the all rights reserved. So we can use the footer tag for this. And that's all there is to marking up a page with semantic HTML. It's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. You just have to get used to the different tags to use to group your content. 
But luckily, most of these tags have pretty self-explanatory names and are pretty obvious when you should use them. And for the few ambiguous ones, you'll get used to them more and more throughout these crash course videos as well as throughout Frontend Expert as a whole. So that'll do it for this video on semantic HTML. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next one. Hey everybody, welcome back to Frontend Expert. In this video, we're going to be going over some essential HTML tags. Now we can't possibly go through every single tag, but we'll go through some of the most frequently used ones and the ones that you might be expected to know what they do on the spot. As we go through these tags, one very important point to remember is how important semantic markup is, meaning that we want to always be using the correct tags for what our HTML means, what our content is. We need to be describing it as best as possible with our tags. And these tags provide content structure not just layout and style. In fact, they don't provide layout and style at all. There are default layout and style properties that are applied by the browser, but HTML does not define what tags actually look like. So with that in mind, we're not going to be looking at the output in this video. We're going to be talking about this in terms of the semantic HTML, and then we can talk later about how exactly we can actually style these tags to get them to look like we want them to. So the first tag we're going to look at is the paragraph, which we've already seen in some of the other Crash Course videos. So paragraphs simply contain the content of a paragraph. So it uses the P tag and inside of it, we put the content. The one point to remember here is that this doesn't have to be just text. Paragraphs can contain some other content, such as images, if that image is part of the semantic paragraph. Next, we're going to talk about headings. The main heading of the page will use the H1 tag. And this means that it is the highest level heading. And then we have H2 tags for subheadings. And this goes all the way down to H6. So you could imagine a, a news article, right? And the main heading of the page would be the name of the website, the name of the publication. So that will be an H1. And then the secondary heading will be the name of the article you're currently reading. This would be an H2. And then an H3 could be used within the article for subheadings that are part of that article. The most important thing to remember here is that font sizes and heading levels are not the same thing. We shouldn't use heading levels to choose a font size. The font sizes that are chosen by the browser are just defaults and we can change them later. We should choose heading levels based on what is the most semantically appropriate tag for our content. Next, let's talk about images. Images use the IMG tag and are used to display an image on the page. This image will have two attributes, the source and the alternative text. So source uses SRC, and this is the path to that image. This can be a relative or absolute path. Relative is like what you see here with the source being dog.png. This is a local file and it is relative to where the HTML file is on the computer or the server. An absolute path on the other hand would be the full path to the image, such as the full path on the computer or server, or a full URL. The alt attribute is used for alternative text, and this is when we aren't able to display the image for any reason. One potential reason for this is screen readers. They need a way to determine what to say the image is of. Another reason for this could just be if somebody's internet wasn't able to download the image for whatever reason, it would need a way to display in the browser what that image was of to give them the best user experience possible. And as we're writing these alt attributes, make sure to write something that's descriptive, that somebody would be able to understand if it was said verbally to them. And also we don't want to be repetitive with information already contained in the tag. For example, you don't want to say image of a dog, you can just say dog, because the fact that it is an image tag implies already the image of a part, and a screen reader would actually end up saying image of a image of a dog in that scenario because it would say that it is an image of and then read out the alt text. Next, we have lists and lists allow us to list out information. And there are two main types of lists, ordered and unordered lists. So an ordered list uses the OL tag for an ordered list. And this tag has children that are list items or LI tags. These are the only children that an ordered list can take. And each LI tag is one item in this list. So for example, if we had a recipe, each step in the recipe would be a list item in the ordered list because you have to do these items in order. And by default, the browser will display these 
as sequential numbered items. So one, two, three, four. But again, we can change this all with CSS. An unordered list works exactly the same way, except there's no defined order to it. An example here could be a to-do list. You don't necessarily need to do those things in order. You just need to do them all. And by default, these will display as bullet points. Next, we have the pre-formatted text or pre-tag, P-R-E. And what we use this for is maintaining white space. If you remember from the HTML basics video, white space is largely ignored in HTML, meaning that it's collapsed down into a single space. Well, sometimes we do want to preserve the white space in our text for whatever reason, and we can use the pre-formatted text for this. So in this example, the this is indented and has a new line text, would show up exactly like that. It would be indented and it would have a new line in the middle of it. And now let's look at one more way we can control white space with our HTML tags, and that is the line break tag. Line break uses the br tag and it's a self closing tag. So remember that means it has no closing tag, and this creates a line break in the page. Now it's important to know that this is not a replacement for CSS layout. It does have some semantic meaning of there actually being a line break in your markup. So you want to make sure you're using it at the right time. An example of this, we have this paragraph and it's representing sort of like an email body or a message body of some kind where it says, dear John, how are you doing? And after dear John, we go to a new line and this is a line break because there's actually semantic meaning to going to a new line here in the middle of this paragraph. You could make an argument that this doesn't even need the line break tag here, and that instead you could just have two paragraphs or that this could be done in a variety of different ways. But I think this is a valid semantic usage of this. However, it does show that a lot of these tags are a bit ambiguous and there are times when there's two or three correct ways to mark up the same HTML file, and that's perfectly okay. Up next, we have the horizontal rule or the HR tag. This works very similar to the BR tag. It's a self-closing tag and it provides a thematic break in the content. And by default, what this will do is the browser is going to draw a horizontal line across the screen. So if we had that blog post again with the two sections and we wanted to say that these two sections need a thematic break between them, they are different pieces of content and we need to separate them, we could use an HR tag and the browser will draw a horizontal line across the screen for us. But it's worth noting that the HR tag should not be thought of as just the horizontal line tag. It is a thematic break and it has semantic meaning. So if all we need is a horizontal line for some visual reason, we can do that with CSS. But if we need that thematic break, we can do it with the HTML tag of the horizontal rule, the HR. Next, we have the anchor tag. And this is how we make hyperlinks. So this is the hypertext portion of HTML. The anchor tag allows us to link to other documents on the web or even other places in the same document that we are currently on. So we use the anchor tag as just the letter A and we have the href property, H-R-E-F, and this contains the link that we are going to. This can be an absolute or relative link. So in this case, we have an absolute link of algoexpert.io. And then inside of the A tag is the actual content. So in this example, if you clicked on Algo Expert, it would bring you to the href, it would bring you to algoexpert.io. Additionally, there are a few other attributes that we can add that affect the way that our link will be opened. The most common one is the target attribute, and this allows us to say if we want to open in a new tab or a new window. So we'll do target equals and then underscore blank. And what this means is to show it in a new tab or a new window, whichever preference the user has in their browser, we can't control which one they're going to do. Most people, this will default to opening in a new tab though. Next up, we have the emphasis tag. And the emphasis tag is EM, and this allows us to wrap some text that we want to put emphasis on. By default, the browser will display this in italics. But again, we don't want to do this just because we need italics. We want to do it because of the semantic importance of emphasis. And we can wrap any piece of text like this. So for example, here we have, I need to study but the word need is wrapped in emphasis, adding a little bit more emphasis to that portion of the text, like I need to study. And by default, the browser would show this entire sentence normally, but the need portion would be italicized. But again, that is something we can change later if we want a different visual representation of the emphasis. 
And finally, we have one last tag to show, and that is the strong tag. The strong tag works very similar to the emphasis tag, except it shows strong importance. And this can be a little bit ambiguous as to what the difference is, and many times either tag would be appropriate. But anyways, in this example, we have a paragraph that says, note, this is important, and we've wrapped the note portion in a strong tag. By default, the browser will show this as a bold text, so it'll bold the note portion. But again, that is something we can change. And with that, that's going to wrap up this video on essential HTML tags. I hope you found it helpful, and I'll see you in the next one. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Frontend Expert. In this video, we'll be talking about HTML tables and going over all of the different tags associated with tables. When we talk about tables, we're referring to tabular data, which simply means data with rows and columns. I like to think of this as anything you could put in a spreadsheet, you could also put in a table. However, anything that you could not put in a spreadsheet also probably does not belong in a table. And we want to be very careful about using tables for this correct purpose and not just using them whenever we need a two column layout, for example. In that case, we would want to use CSS with the correct appropriate HTML tags for our content. And with that in mind, let's go ahead and create our first table. So to create a table, we'll use the table tag. And this tag is a wrapper around the entire table. And inside of this table, we will include all of the rows of the table which we do with the table row tag or TR. And then in each row, we need to define whatever data is in that row, whichever cells are part of the row. And we can do that using the TD tag for table data. And for example, let's say this one is $200. And now we can go ahead and save and we'll have $200 on the screen as our first table data. And we could go ahead and add another piece of table data and maybe this one is just $100 and we'll save again. And you'll see the second piece of data within the row appears to the right of the first piece of data within that row. However, if we wanted some data to appear in another row below the $200 and $100, we'll add another TR tag for another table row. So we can do that now, TR, and then we'll add some data inside of this row. And maybe this one is going to be $250. And then we'll add another piece of data below it for maybe $300. And I'll go ahead and save. And you can see that new row appears below the first row we had. At the top, we have the first table row, which is $200 and $100. then we have $200 and $100 at the top of our output. Finally, we have $250 and $300, which corresponds to the last row in our HTML. One thing you might notice here is that we have no headings on the table. Because of this, the data in the cells has no actual meaning. To add table headings, we simply make another table row, except this row will be a row of headings rather than data. So we'll do a table row, and then inside of the row, instead of table data, we'll use the th tag for table heading. We can say this first column is going to be our budget, and then we can say the second column with another table heading will be our spending. We can go ahead and save and you can see by default, we get this nice bold text that appears at the top of the table because it's the first row. And these have headings of budget and spending, which can correspond to the columns below them. Now headings don't only work for a column. We also sometimes need a heading for an individual row. If we look at this example, it still doesn't really make sense. We know we budgeted $200, but what did we actually budget that for? So what we can go ahead and do is in our table rows, we can add table headings in line to these individual rows. So here we can say maybe this was our food budget. And then in the bottom table row, we can say this was our entertainment budget. And when we go ahead and save, you can see we get the new headings, but it sort of shifted everything over. And the issue here is that these bottom table rows each have three items in them, three cells or three columns, but the top table row only has two. So these two headings are shifted over farther than we want. To fix this, I'll go ahead and add another table heading here. And this will be the heading for the far left column that says food and entertainment. 
I'll go ahead and call this category. And when I save, our table should look correct again. But something you might have noticed while looking at this is that we're using some of the same tags for multiple different purposes. And we know that semantically that can be confusing. If we have the same tag used for two different things, how would somebody using a screen reader, for example, know what's what? How do they know if this category heading is a heading for the column or for the row? And the short answer is they might not be able to know. So the way we can fix that is using an attribute. And the attribute we can use is called scope. So I'll add scope to this category heading. And what scope says is, is this heading for a row or a column? And in this case, this is a heading for a column. So we can add scope equals column. And I'll go ahead and do the same thing for the budget and the spending. And then we can come down to our food heading and we can add another scope here, but this one is a row heading. So we'll do scope equals row and we'll do the same thing for entertainment. And when I save here, you'll notice nothing really changes in the output. Everything is the exact same. The only difference is just that we have a more semantically appropriate HTML file, and it'll make more sense to people using accessibility tools. Just like we're using table headings for multiple purposes, you might have also noticed we are using table rows for multiple purposes. So at the top here, we have a table row that just contains headings. However, these table rows contain actual data in the table, and we need a way to differentiate these as well. And the way we do this is using semantic grouping tags, but tags that are specific to the table. So at the top of the table, we'll add a T head, which is very similar to the header tag that we use for a standard semantic grouping tag, but this takes whatever header information the table has, and in this case, it's this top row. And then we also have another tag that we can use called T body for table body. And this contains the actual main body, the data of the table. And we'll put these two rows inside of there. And now again, this isn't going to change the output. It just makes our HTML a little bit cleaner and more semantically correct. Next up, it would be nice if we had some totals. This way our user could see the total budget or the total spending without having to do that addition themselves. So the way we can go ahead and do that is to add a footer and the footer will use the T foot tag. So we can add a T foot here. And then inside of this, we will add more table rows. So we can add a table row and this will be the row for this footer. And then within this row, we'll go ahead and add a table heading. And this will be the heading for the total column. So we can call this total. And then we can go ahead and add the actual data. So the first data will be 200 plus $250, which is going to be $450. And then we can add one more table data for 100 and 300, which will be $400. Now, this would usually be better to do with JavaScript rather than hard coding these values into the HTML. However, for now, this is fine just to show what this table footer would look like. And sometimes you have data that actually isn't going to change, in which case it can be fine to just manually do this using HTML. And now one last component to our table that we are missing is we don't have any name or heading for the table. There's no title to this table, if you will. And the way we can fix that is to go all the way back to the top. And at the very beginning of our table, we'll go ahead and add what's called the caption tag. And this is just like it sounds. It's the caption for the table or sort of like a heading for it. We'll go ahead and just call this our budget. And when we save, you can see we get that budget text at the top, which by default is centered and looks quite nice. But again, we can always change what any of the table looks like using CSS. And with that, we not only have a completed table, but we also have a table that is accessible due to our use of these semantic components. However, I do want to show a few more attributes and a few more tags that we can use for some more specific use cases. So one attribute that we can add to both table headings as well as to our individual pieces of table data is going to be this column span attribute or call span. And what this says is essentially how many columns is this a heading for? Most of the time we have headings that are just for one column like this one is. But for example, if we added the value of two here, you would see that all of our headings sort of shifted over one column. And the reason for that is because now the category is spanning two columns. 
And you can do the same thing with rows as well to do a row span if you wanted to do that. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and delete this and go back to our properly marked up table. And lastly, there's one more tag I wanted to show, and that's called a column group. So we can go ahead and go up here and create a column group. And what the column group is, is it allows you to select the columns of the table. And the purpose of this is mostly just for CSS. We don't actually need the column group for the proper semantic markup of our HTML. So the way this is going to work is you add a col column here. And within this column, you need to define a span. And this is how many of the columns you want this to affect. So for example, we can say span equals two. And then this is a self-closing tag. And you'll see this doesn't actually change the output at all. But what we can do here is add styles or CSS classes to this column that will affect the entire columns that are spanned. So the first two columns in this instance. So for example, we could do style equals, we can say background red. And I would usually not recommend using inline styles like this, but just to show what this looks like when we do style as background red, it will change the first two columns because we have span equals two to being red. And again, I would not recommend using this inline style syntax. I would recommend instead using a class and doing something like class equals red and then defining that class in CSS, but I don't have that CSS defined at the moment. So I'll go ahead and delete this column group. And that'll be the end of this video on HTML tables. So to quickly recap, we create a table using the table tag, and then we add at the top of it a caption, which is sort of a name for the table. And then within the table, first we have the table head, which contains the top row of the table with the column headers. And then below that, we'll add the table body, which contains each of the individual table rows with actual data. And then at the bottom, we'll have a table foot. If there's any things like total rows or any footer style rows that don't contain actual data, they contain some aggregate of the data. And then with each table heading, for example, this one for the food heading, we'll add a scope attribute to make sure that our semantic markup explains what this is a heading for. Is it a heading for a row? or for a column. And with that, that's going to do it for this video on HTML tables. I hope you found it helpful and I'll see you in the next video. Hey everybody, welcome back to Frontend Expert. In this video, we'll be discussing HTML forms and how we can start taking in user input. And then in the JavaScript crash course, we will revisit this topic and discuss how we can take that user input and send it all the way back to our servers. So, to get started, we can create the form tag, and the form tag is a wrapper around all of our form inputs, or widgets as they are sometimes referred to. And to create an input, most of the time we will use the input tag, and this is a fairly generic tag that contains almost every type of input we could need, and we define what type of input we want using the type attribute. And here I'll go ahead and say that this is a text input, and we can close out this tag, it is a self-closing tag, and then we can save and we will see that in the output, we get this text box where I can go ahead and type and it will work exactly as you would expect. But from here, we need a way to tell the user what they need to be typing here. What is this input? And we can do this using the label tag. Above the input, we'll go ahead and add one more tag and this will be a label. And maybe this is a username. And then we can go ahead and save and you see we get this username text to the left of the input. And with a username input, we should probably also have a password input. So let's go ahead and do that as well. I'll go ahead and create another label, call this one password. And then down below the password, we can create an input of let's say type equals password. And the password type works just like the text type with the one difference being that when we type into the password input, it shows these black dots instead of showing the actual text. And this is nice because sometimes our users might be signing into a website from somewhere like a coffee shop or a public workplace, and they don't want everyone around them who can see their computer screen to also be able to see their passwords. Now, one thing you might notice when looking at our HTML is we have two different label tags, but those labels are just adjacent to other inputs, which makes it less clear what they are labeling. They're not surrounding any inputs. For example, this password label. Is it a label for the input below it or a label for the input above it? 
And we know because they're both passwords that it's the label for the one below it, but that might not be clear to the browser that is just trying to understand our markup. And the way we can fix this is by adding one more attribute. So on the label tags, we will add a for attribute. And the for attribute says, what is this a label for? What is it connected to? And it takes in an ID. So we'll say this one is for username. And this ID needs to be a unique ID that exists one time on the page. And we can add that as an attribute to our input. So we can say ID equals username. And essentially what we're saying here is that this is the only element on the page that will have this identifier of username. And the label will then use that username to determine what it is labeling. And we can do the exact same thing for the password. So we can say this one is for password. And we can give this input an ID of password. And now when I save, you'll notice nothing actually changes in the output. It is the exact same. The only difference being that our HTML is marked up a little bit better. So it will work better for people using accessibility tools such as a screen reader. And from here, there are tons of different attributes that we could add to the inputs to customize them even more. But one in particular that I think is important is called the placeholder. So we can add a placeholder to this input. And what this placeholder does is it allows us to create some text that will show up in the text box, but slightly grayed out when there's no other text there to give the user an idea of what type of text we are expecting. So maybe this will be user one, two, three. We'll go ahead and hit save. And you can see now in the output box, we have user one, two, three. But once I start typing, that will go away. And then when I backspace, user one, two, three will come back. And now we need a way for the user to submit the form. We need them to be able to say they are done typing in their username and password and to send that data back to the server. And the way we do that is by adding a button to the bottom. So I'll go ahead and do that. And we can call this submit. Now, alternatively, we can also use an input tag for this with the type of submit. So we can say input type equals submit. And this will work the exact same way. Personally, I prefer the button tag because I think it looks a little bit nicer, but it's up to you. The one thing is just to make sure you are being consistent. Now, when a user clicks submit, we will send the data back to the server. However, that server isn't going to know what all of the data is. It's not going to know what user123 is, so we need to tell it that it is a username. So the way we do that is by adding one more attribute to the inputs, and we call this attribute name. So we can add a name attribute here, and we'll make this one password. And then we'll add a name attribute to the username as well. Name equals username. And just to make this a little bit easier to read, I'll go ahead and move all of these attributes onto their own lines just to keep things nice and tidy. Okay, so now that we have that, when we go ahead and type in a username and password, so I'll make my username user and my password pass, and I hit submit, what we'll see is one, the form clears itself out, but second, in the URL, we also have the username and password that I typed in. Now you might be saying this isn't very helpful. Why would we want to send the username and password just to the URL? And this is the default behavior, but we can actually customize this using the form element itself. So on the form tag, we can add some attributes here, first being the action. And this says, where do we want to send this data? So maybe I want to send it to slash my API. And then we can say, what method do we want to use? By default, this will be a get request which is going to send the value in the URL, but we could also change this to a post request, which will say we want to send the values via the post request body. And then again, we can go to JavaScript and customize this even more to get exactly what we want out of this form submit action. But for now, I'll go ahead and just remove these attributes and we will revisit that again in the JavaScript crash course. Another thing you might have noticed is I was able to submit a password that was only four characters long. And this isn't great. We want our users to be submitting passwords that have more security to them than that. And we can do this with form validation. So each of the input tags can take different attributes that allow us to validate them or decide if the input the user has given us is a valid input for what we want. And if it's not valid, the form won't submit. So for example, on the password input, we can go ahead and add a minimum length 
of let's say six. And this just says that this password needs to be at least six characters long. And I'll go ahead and move these attributes onto new lines as well so that everything looks nice and clean and easy to read. And now when I go ahead and save and try to submit this again, so I'll do the exact same thing, user and pass, I'll hit submit, but it will give me this error message that my password needs to be a little bit longer. So I can go ahead and say pass one, two now and hit submit and that will work because now the password is fitting the criteria that we have set with minimum length. We can also add a required attribute and the required attribute is a Boolean that just says that this field is required. So for example, I'll add required to the username input, go ahead and hit save. And now if I try to submit with no username, we'll get this error message that says, please fill out this field. So now I can say user and it will let me submit without the password because the password doesn't currently have a required attribute. To fix this, I can go ahead and set the required attribute on the password as well. And one thing you'll notice here is that we are just setting the attributes using the name. This is because they're Boolean attributes. So if we just add the required text, it will set that to true. Alternatively, we can say required equals required, but personally, I prefer to just have the name. I think it looks a little bit cleaner. Up next, there are a few more types of inputs that we should look at that can be useful for a variety of situations. So let's go ahead and add another input tag. And this one we can say is going to be a type of date. And type of date allows a user to pick a date. We get a pretty nice UI here by default that makes it easy to type into. I'll put January 1st, 2025. And you can see it sort of autofills this in for me with the forward slashes in a nice readable format. And I can also click on this to open up this date picker UI where I can pick a date through the actual calendar. Up next, let's go ahead and look at the checkbox input. So the checkbox input allows us to take in some user input of a Boolean value. So have they accepted the terms of service, for example, is probably the most common use case of checkboxes. And when you click this box, it simply sets its value to true. And when you click on it again, the check goes away, making the checkbox false. But sometimes we don't want to just take in one value like this. We want the user to have an option of say three values and they have to pick one. And the way we can do that is using a radio button. So we'll change this type to radio and radio buttons have a few more parameters they need. So first we have a name and the name is going to be in this case, the name of the group of radio buttons. So not just the name for this one input. So we can call this animal, for example, to make an input to choose an animal. And then we can go ahead and give this a value as well. And maybe this first one is going to be a dog input. And we can also go ahead and label this as dog. And we can say that this label is for our dog and give this input an ID of dog. Now we can copy this a few different times. That way we can create a few different radio buttons. And let's go ahead and go down to the second one and maybe change this to be cat. So this will be our cat input. Change the ID as well to match the for attribute and we need to change the value. However, the name stays the same because this name represents the name for all of these radio buttons that are connected to each other. And on this last one, let's go ahead and change it as well. Let's make it horse and we can change the for attribute and we will also change the ID and the value. Now, if we save the HTML file, we will see that we have dog, cat, and horse. And of course we could fix in CSS the fact that they are not all in one line. But what's cool about these is I can only select one at a time. So as I select them, it will move my selection rather than allowing me to multi-select. Now, if you look at the HTML for these radio buttons, you might notice that they are sort of semantically related to each other, but we have nothing connecting them in the HTML. And the way we usually do this is by adding a field set. So the field set is very similar to our semantic grouping tags. The only difference being that the field set is meant to contain form inputs and their labels. So now we can go ahead and take all of these labels and inputs and go ahead and move them inside of the field set. So this will be our field set for the radio buttons. Now, when I save this, you'll see the field set causes everything to move onto its own line. And it also gives us a border wrapping all of the inputs. But again, this is something we can change in CSS if we don't like it. And in each field set, in addition to the labels and inputs, 
we also usually add a title or a name for the field set. And the way we do this is with a tag called the legend. So I'll go ahead and add that here. We have legend. And inside of here, we give the name for the field set or whatever text we want associated with it. I'll say, choose your animal. And when I save, you'll see this text sort of appears inside of that border of the field set. But again, we can always change this with CSS if we don't like it. And that's all there is to creating an HTML form. There are tons of other types of inputs and attributes we can use. We couldn't possibly go over every single one, but they all follow this same sort of syntax and formula. To give a quick recap, we create this form element, and this is going to wrap our entire form. And then each input of the form will be an input tag, as well as it will have a label associated with it using the for attribute, which is based on an ID attribute on the actual input. And then on these inputs, we give them a type to define what type of input we want. And finally, we need to also have this name parameter so that we can give a name to the input when we are sending it back to the server. Lastly, we saw the radio buttons work a little bit differently in that they all share a name because we only are sending one value back to the server for all three of these inputs. And that value will be which input did they select. And then we wrap these in a field set to semantically group the input tags together. And that field set will be named using the legend tag. And finally, at the end, we use the button tag or an input of type submit to create a submit button that will send that data back to the server. By default, this will just add it to the URL. But like we saw, we can change the attributes on the form tag to change that behavior. Or more likely, we can do that in JavaScript, as we'll see soon in the JavaScript crash course. And with that, I hope you found this video to be helpful. I'll see you in the next one. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Frontend Expert. In this video, we'll be discussing the document object model, or the DOM for short. So the question we're trying to answer with the DOM is what actually happens to our HTML? First, the browser receives our HTML and it receives this as a text file. And then it needs to convert that text file into something more usable. Specifically, it converts it into what we call the DOM tree or the document object model tree. And this is a tree-like representation of the contents of our HTML file. From here, it's able to take the DOM tree and use it to generate the actual user interface that we are displaying to our users. Now this DOM or document object model has a few different purposes. It allows the browser to keep track of what's on the page, but it also provides us with an API that we can interact with via JavaScript or really any other programming language. And we'll see how to do that in the JavaScript crash course. And when we interact with the DOM via this API, we will be interacting with it as a tree because that is how it's storing our HTML file. The way this works is that it stores each of the elements in our HTML file, so each tag, as a node in the tree. Additionally, text will also be stored as a node, as well as there are a few other less common types of nodes, such as comments. And I think the best way to understand this is to just go ahead and look at an example and create a document object model tree from scratch. So let's go ahead and do that now. Here we have an HTML file that looks very similar to the ones we've seen so far in this crash course. So if we look at this file, we have the HTML tags and inside of the HTML tags is the head and the body, just like always. Inside of the head, we have our title. In this case, the title is my web page. And then inside of the body, we have two more tags. We have an H1, so a top level heading that simply says, hello world. And then we have a paragraph that says, hello, how are you? But after hello, we have a line break tag with the BR. Now let's go ahead and start drawing the DOM tree. So the DOM always starts with the document. The document is the root of everything in our web page. It is the highest level item in the DOM tree. The document should always have exactly one child, and this will be the HTML tag because the HTML tag is the top level tag of our HTML code that contains all of our other tags. Inside of the HTML tag, as you can see in our code, as well as just how we have always written it, is a head and a body. This means that the HTML tag in our tree will have two children. First, it will have the head tag as its first child. This is because the head tag appears first in the code. And then the second child 
will be the body tag. This is because the body tag appears second in the code after the head tag, but both of them are direct children of the HTML tag. Now we can go ahead and look at the head, and inside of the head, we only have one tag, and that is the title. So the head will have one child node, and that child node will be the title tag. Now within the title tag, all we have is text. So this will be our first text node, and the node will simply say my web page because that is the text that appears in the HTML code. Now we can go back up and look at the body because we've added everything from the head into the DOM tree. So in the body, we have two tags and we can start at the first one. We always go from top to bottom. That's the same way that the browser is going to look at our code. And the first tag is going to be an H1. So we can add an H1 as a child to the body. And then this H1 tag only has one child. That one child is a text node. And again, if we look at our code, the text inside of the H1 says hello world. So that will be the text node that we have in the DOM tree. And then next, the body also contains another child, and that is a paragraph tag. So we can add a child node, and that child node will be the paragraph tag. But this paragraph tag has some more complicated children. If we look at it, it has some text, and then it has a line break, and then it has more text. And the way we handle this is we always add children in order of how they appear in the actual HTML file. So first, we will have a text node. And this text node will have the contents of hello. And then we will also include the comma as that is part of the text. And then after that, we will have another child. And this child will be the line break tag because the line break tag came after the hello in the text file in the HTML. Now I will go ahead and move everything over just a little bit so we can have a little bit more space. And we can add the last text node of our last paragraph. And that text node will be the text of how are you and then the question mark. And once we've added that node to the tree, we've completed all of the content of the HTML file that we were given, and therefore we have completed the DOM tree. And with that, that's going to be the end of this video. I hope you found it helpful, and I'll see you in the next one. Hey everybody, welcome back to Frontend Expert. In this video, we'll be discussing accessibility and how we can make our websites work for as many people as possible. Or optimally, we want our websites to be usable by the entire population. And when we talk about accessibility, we're referring to people using the internet in different ways, as well as people with different abilities that can affect the ways that they can consume our content. So for example, some people navigate the internet using only a keyboard rather than a keyboard and a mouse. Moreover, rather than using a screen to visually look at the output, some people use a screen reader that verbally tells them the contents of the website. And we need to be accounting for all of these different cases and a bunch more to make sure that our website is working for as many people as possible. In many of these cases, our users will be using assistive technologies, such as a screen reader, to interact with our website. And these assistive technologies actually don't interact with the DOM directly. Instead, they interact with what's known as the accessibility tree, which is a tree containing content specific to accessibility that is easier for these assistive technologies to understand. Each node in these trees has four main components to it. First, a name, which is oftentimes synonymous with the text content of that node, but not always. The description can provide some more information on top of that name. It's a little bit more detailed for times when we need a little bit more context about the element. Next, the role explains what exactly the node is doing. For example, a checkbox would have the checkbox role. And then we have state, and the state provides any current state about that node. So in the case of a checkbox, it could have a checked state or an unchecked state. And lots of different roles have different options for their state. Originally, we said we had this HTML file, which got converted into the DOM. Then the DOM is converted into the actual UI, which is shown to the end user. However, this isn't always the case. The DOM is actually split in two. 
One, it's converted into a user interface, but it's also converted into the accessibility tree, which is used for these assistive technologies. And then these assistive technologies also go to the user. So users can take the input of our content in two different ways. This means that at the core of writing accessible HTML is writing HTML that will properly fill out the accessibility tree. And there's a few ways we can focus on doing that. So first, we need to make sure we are using descriptive content, labels, and alt attributes. Next, we want to make sure we are using the semantically appropriate elements. When we do this, the accessibility tree will get automatically filled in based on what element we use. However, if we use generic elements, such as a div, which is just a generic wrapper element, then we will have a very unspecific accessibility tree and our website won't be very accessible. In addition to focusing on the accessibility tree, we also want to ensure our website is usable with keyboard controls. This means ensuring that somebody can navigate to all of the major portions of the website using just a keyboard and that they can properly interact with all of our inputs. Most of the time, just writing good semantic HTML is enough to keep our websites accessible. However, sometimes we need to write more complex web applications and these end up using less semantic tags for some specific use cases. And because of this, there's a new initiative created called WayArea, or the Web Accessibility Initiative, Accessible Rich Internet Applications. This is usually just referred to as ARIA and it was written by W3C. ARIA provides more attributes that we can use in HTML to further describe our content and fill out the accessibility tree. So first we have the ARIA role, and this allows us to define the role of the element, which can be used in the accessibility tree role. Next, we have properties, and these allow us to provide some extra meaning, such as giving a label to an element that doesn't usually have one. And finally, we can provide some state, which again aligns to the accessibility tree state and allows us to provide state to elements that usually don't have it, such as if we have a disabled state. ARIA roles are broken down into a variety of different categories, the first of these being landmark roles. And the landmarks are simply major content areas or navigational landmarks. Oftentimes, these are what the user will navigate to first when they are using assistive technology. Some examples of these are banners, the main content, or navigation. And you might notice that these are very similar to what we have in semantic grouping tags. And in fact, semantic grouping tags all have a landmark role associated with them. And for that reason, we should almost always be using those tags instead of manually setting a landmark role. However, it can be nice to know that we can do that if we ever need to. Next, we have structure roles. And structure roles are very similar to landmark roles in that they define some structure of the page, they explain what a section of content is doing. However, the difference is that a landmark role is a navigational landmark, something that a user might want to go to first, whereas a structure role is a little bit less important. It's smaller pieces of structure, such as a tooltip, a list, or a table. Widget roles identify interactive elements. So when we use something like a div, but we want a user to be able to know that they can click on it to interact with it, to do something with it, we use the widget role. Some examples of these can be tabs, a search box, or a button. And again, you'll see that some of these align to elements that we already have in HTML. And in those cases, you should almost always use the proper HTML tag rather than adding a widget role manually. But there are some widget roles that exist that we don't have a tag that directly maps to it. And in those cases, widget roles are good to be using. Next, we have window roles. And window roles create sub windows within the browser. So this is removing some content from the rest of the page to say that it is separate from it. This is usually in the form of a modal, but not always. There are only two types of window roles currently, and that is a dialog and an alert dialog. A dialog does just that. It removes some content from the rest of the flow of the browser and says that this content is different. It is sort of a piece of dialog. It is separate. An alert dialog does the exact same thing, except it is an alert, meaning that it has high importance and it's something that needs the user's attention immediately. Next, we have live region roles, and these define dynamically changing content. This means that anything inside of a live region role element will be checked on periodically by the assistive technology to inform the user of any changes to that content. Based on what type of role you use, it will determine how often the assistive technology is checking in on it and if it's looking at updates immediately or just periodically. 
Some examples of this will be a timer, a log of information that has happened over time, or an alert with new information that we need to tell the user. Similar to live region roles, we also have an attribute known as aria live. And this attribute defines some live content, so dynamically changing content, and how important it is. So how often we need to be telling users about that changing content. Every live region role will have a default aria live attribute value, but we can always change those manually using the aria live attribute. We can also set them on things that do not have the live region role if there's not a role that actually correlates to what your content is, but it's still a live region. This attribute has three different values. First is off, which simply says that the content does not need to be watched by assistive technology and any changes will not be announced to the user. Next, we have polite, which says that this content is changing. There's something dynamic here, but you don't necessarily need to revisit it super frequently. And Usually what happens with this is the assistive technology will announce any changes when it's idle. So for example, a screen reader, when it's not currently saying anything, will go back to all of the live regions to see if there's any changes, and then it will announce those changes to the user. Finally, assertive means that this information is of the utmost importance and we need to tell the user about it as soon as possible. This is usually for things like alert messages that we need to tell the user about for them to be able to continue using the application or the website. Now let's go ahead and look at a few more ARIA properties that we can use to enhance the accessibility of our websites. So first we have the ARIA label attribute, and this allows you to label some element, but this label won't be visible on the UI when it gets rendered, it will just be part of the markup and part of the accessibility tree. This is really nice when there are times when there's some information that you could get just by looking at the website visually, but that somebody won't be able to get if they're using assistive technology such as a screen reader. Next, we have the aria labeled by attribute, and this works very similar to the for attribute that we've seen on labels, except it's in reverse. An element is able to say that some other element is its label. So in the example below of the dialog, you can see the H2 with successfully saved changes is being used as the label for the entire dialog. Next, we have the aria description. And what this does is it allows you to provide a more detailed description of an element. So it works just like ARIA labels, except it can be a little bit longer. It can be more detailed. And then ARIA described by works just like ARIA labeled by, except again, this is for a description. So it's meant for a long form description of the content rather than just a quick little heading or label about it. Now let's look at some ARIA states. So ARIA states, provide stateful information about an element. This is usually used with inputs that we need to tell the user what the current state of that input is. And you'll notice that most of these are things we can get by default using the proper input tags. However, there are times when we can't use those input tags or there's just not an appropriate tag for what we need. And in those cases, setting ARIA state manually can be very helpful for our accessibility. First, we have ARIA checked, which is a state for elements with the role of checkbox and this can be either true, false, or undefined. You can see in the example below, we have I am checked inside of a div with the role checkbox, and aria checked is set to true, meaning that this checkbox is currently checked. You might notice that this value is an actual string of true, and this is how most of the aria states will work. We need to provide string values of true or false or occasionally undefined. And then we have aria disabled, which is useful for pretty much any type of input that we can tell a user, hey, this is currently disabled for whatever reason, so you can't currently interact with it. ARIA expanded is nice for accordion style elements where you open it and then you can see more content and this can tell you if it's currently expanded or not. Similar to this, we have ARIA hidden, which can tell you if any content is currently not visible on the screen. Somebody using the UI would be able to see this visually, but when somebody's using assistive technology like a screen reader, they have no way to know if that content is currently being hidden by CSS. So we can add the aria hidden attribute, which tells the user just that. Next, we have aria pressed, which can tell the user about the current state of a toggle. Is it currently pressed in or is it not? Lastly, we have aria selected, which is pretty self-explanatory. It tells the user if an element is currently selected or not. And again, there are a bunch more ARIA states. You could imagine pretty much any time that you have some stateful information that you would want to tell the user, there's probably an ARIA state that is associated with that information that you can add to make your website more accessible.
Now finally, there are some other concerns we should discuss related to accessibility that can't necessarily be solved using ARIA attributes or even using HTML at all. First is browser compatibility. Some people will inevitably be using older versions of browsers that they haven't updated in a long time, and we need to account for this. This sometimes means avoiding using the most cutting edge new features of HTML and waiting a little bit of time before using those so that more people have updated their browsers to have compatibility with those new features. Next, we have CSS accessibility, or just generally our style accessibility. This means making sure our font sizes are clear and legible, our font choices are legible, and our colors are contrasting enough so that somebody can see the difference between different elements on the page very easily. Moreover, we need to be supporting different device sizes to make sure that somebody using a mobile phone, for instance, will have the same great experience as somebody using a large 4K monitor. Lastly, with larger web applications, and especially ones that have demographics outside of your current region, we need to consider internationalization, which is oftentimes abbreviated as I18N. And what this means is how can we get our website to work in as many places and as many languages as possible? This means we need language support for different regions, but not just that, we need to make sure that our layout works regardless of what language somebody is using. For example, some languages have text that goes vertically instead of horizontally, and sometimes that can break a layout when somebody tries to translate the page, so we need to make sure that our website is robust enough to handle these different use cases. Now we've moved over to the code editor, and let's do a quick demo to demonstrate the power of the ARIA attributes. So in this demo, we have three tabs, tab one, two, and three, and as we click through them, you can see we get different panels that display on the screen. And now if we look at the actual HTML that is accomplishing this, it's quite simple. In the head, we have a title, and then we have a script in the link tag. We don't need to worry about these too much. This is how we are linking in the JavaScript and the CSS, and we'll talk about this more in the JavaScript and CSS crash courses. But just know the CSS is giving these nice colors on the screen and the JavaScript is what's hooking up the actual tabs to work. And then in the body, we have the actual markup for this page. So first we have an ordered list with three list items, tab one, two, and three. And these correspond to the three tabs at the top of the page. And then we have three divs. And again, divs are just empty wrapper elements. And these represent each of the three panels. So we have panel one, and this is the one you can currently see. Then we have panels two and three. Now panels two and three each have a class hidden, which CSS is using to actually hide these. So anything with class hidden is not going to be displayed on the page at all. Now this is great and it works perfectly, but what about somebody using assistive technology like a screen reader? How would this work for them? Would they be able to understand this markup? Well, in the Chrome DevTools, we can actually get access to the accessibility tree and see what information they have to work on. So if we come over here and select any element, let's go into the ordered list, we can see to the right of these styles, we have an option for the accessibility tab. Inside of the accessibility tab, we get the accessibility tree, ARIA attributes, as well as some computed properties. So if we look at the accessibility tree, it's quite simple. We have a list, which makes sense. That represents the list of items. And then we have three list items, one for each tab. And then we can go into one of these list items and we can see the contents of it. So in this case, all it has is the static text of tab one. And then we can see in the computed properties, it has no ARIA labels, it has no title, and the role is list item. And again, we can go back up and see that all of these are sort of the exact same. So then my question would be, if somebody had access to just this, how would they know that these are tabs? How would they know that they can click on them? All they see is that there's list items and they have some static text. And the answer to that is they want it. There would be no way to know that these are actually interactive elements that the user can click on. And the way we can fix that is with our ARIA attributes. So let's come back over to our code and see if we can fix this code up to get it to work exactly how we would actually expect it to so that somebody using these assistive technologies can interact with our website just as well as somebody who's using the actual monitor. So I think the first order of business here is to go ahead and assign some roles. Roles are really the first thing we usually want to do when we're working with ARIA attributes is make sure that everything has a proper role. And right now this list and the list items had the list related roles and that's not exactly what we want. We want these to be tabs. So let's go ahead and go into our ordered list 
and change the role. The role here we want is actually going to be tab list. And this is sort of like a list, but it's a list of tabs. That way the assistive technology knows that these are tabs that we can click on and choose what tab we want. And then each of the list items, we can give a role of tab. So this is sort of a list item for the tab list. And I'll go ahead and copy this over to each of the other list items. And next we need to go into these individual divs, so the individual panels, and let the accessibility tree know that these are panels for these tabs. So if we go into one of these, let's go to the top one, and we can go ahead and give it a role of tab panel. And what this says is that it's a panel associated with the tabs, and we can go ahead and copy this into each of these divs. Now this is a good start, but we need to actually connect the tabs with the tab panels. So if we go back up to the tabs, we can add another attribute. And this one is one we actually haven't seen yet, and it's called ARIA controls. And ARIA controls is an attribute that says that this is sort of controlling something else. And in this case, these tabs control whether or not another panel is visible. So we can say ARIA controls, and then we'll give it an ID. So let's say this one is panel one. And I'll go ahead and copy this to the other tabs and change them to panel two. And we can copy it one more time and make this panel three. And then we need to come down into our tab panels and give them IDs that are the same as the values that we said are being controlled. So we can say this is panel one. This one can be ID of panel, panel two. And then this last one down here can have an ID of panel three. Now that we've told the accessibility tree which tabs are associated with which panels, we also need to tell it which one is currently selected. And by default, the first one is selected. So we'll give this first one an aria selected of true. And we can go ahead and move this onto new lines just to get everything easy to read. Go like that. And we can move this onto a new line as well. Okay, so now we have ARIA selected as true for the first value, and then the second one will be ARIA selected as false. And again, we can go to some new lines, get things nice and tidy, easy to read, move these down, and we can move the content onto its own line as well, which I think just makes it nice and clear. And get some new lines here. And then finally, we can copy this ARIA selected as false, into the last tab because this one is also not currently selected. And we can go ahead and move this one to new lines as well, just to be consistent with all the rest and make sure that we're not going way off the screen with our work. Great, so now what we have is we have these list items and they have ARIA controls, which says this is the panel that this is currently controlling. And then we have ARIA selected, which says whether or not this tab is the tab that is currently selected, the one that is currently in use. I'll also go ahead down here in this tab theory and move this over to be aligned with all the other ones. So now the one last thing that we might want to do here is also add some labels because we have these panels down here and they're not really labeled. We sort of just have these empty divs. And I think most of the time, if you have a div that doesn't seem to be doing a whole lot, especially if it has an ARIA role, it almost definitely needs a label as well. So what we can do with this, we could just do an ARIA label, but I think the better option here is to do ARIA labeled by and set these to be labeled by the actual tabs. So this one will be labeled by tab one, and then we'll do the same thing for the other panels. So we can say that this one is labeled by tab two. And since this one has the class hidden, it's starting to go off the page as well. So we can go ahead and go to new lines. All right, there we go. And then down here, we can do the exact same thing for this last one. So this one will be labeled by tab three. And again, we can go down to new lines just to get everything fitting on the screen nicely. Perfect. And now if we go all the way back up to our tabs, we just need to give those IDs to these tabs because right now we have tab one, two, and three, but it has no idea what that actually means. So we can go down here and say, this is ID of tab one. The second list item will be ID of tab two. And then the third list item will be ID of tab three. Okay, so now we should have some 
pretty complete ARIA attributes that are giving much better accessibility to our page. So let's review real quick and then we'll play with this in the accessibility tree in the Chrome inspector to see what everything is actually doing. So first we changed our ordered list to have a role of tab list saying that this is a list of tabs, so selectable tabs that we can click on and choose which tab we want to be on. And then inside of here, we have list items, which each have a role of tab, which says that this is one of the tabs in the tab list and you can sort of click on it to select something. Specifically, you can click on it to control a panel with the ID, in this case, panel one. And this one is already selected. So aria selected equals true, says that this one is selected, whereas the other ones are set to false because they are not currently selected. And then if we come down to the actual panels, we've given them a role of tab panel, which sort of associates them with those tabs. And then we have labeled them based on the tabs. So this one, for instance, is labeled by tab one. This one is labeled by tab two and so on and so forth. And now I'll go ahead and refresh the browser and we can look through the exact same thing. So in the accessibility tree now, you can see this has changed to a tab list instead of just a list. Then we have tabs, tab one, tab two and tab three. So if we go into one of the tabs, for instance, we have a ARIA role, which says it's a tab, and we see that it controls panel one. We also see that this one is currently selected, which is nice. And now if I go ahead and hit panel two, you can see some values have changed in the DOM. And if we look at tab one now, it is now ARIA selected of false. And we could go down to tab two, and this one is now ARIA selected of true. We can also come down to the actual tab panels and see that they have a role of tab panel as well as ARIA labeled by tab one. You can actually see that this one being tab one is actually showing up as ignored and that's because CSS is hiding it from the DOM. So we sort of implicitly get the ARIA hidden attribute, which is pretty nice. So most of the time, if you hide things using CSS, you actually don't need to worry about ARIA hidden, which is super great. It makes it much easier to deal with accessibility. But if we go down to panel two, for instance, you'll see that this one has some information it is tab panel two, and then we have the paragraph inside with its static text. And if we go to that tab panel, see it has the role of tab panel and it's labeled by tab two. I hope this has been a useful demo to understand how exactly ARIA labels get used in the accessibility tree. And I hope it is clear that this version of the accessibility tree we have now is much easier for a screen reader or really any assistive technology to understand and to use because it has much more useful information than just saying that these are some list items. Knowing that they're tabs and that they're controlling something else is really valuable information. And the only way that somebody using one of these assistive technology tools would be able to interact with our website at all. That's going to end this demo on accessibility with ARIA attributes. But one more point I did want to make is that I wouldn't recommend trying to memorize every single ARIA attribute and every single ARIA role. They'll come to you as you work more with accessibility, but it's really not a great use of time, just like it's not a great use of time to try to memorize every single HTML tag. There's always more to learn, more to do with accessibility. Even in this demo here, there's probably more we could do to label a few more things and be even more semantic with our HTML. But anyways, that's going to go ahead and end this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something and I'll see you in the next one. Hey everybody, and welcome back to Frontend Expert. In this video, we'll be discussing the HTML head tag and all of the metadata it can contain. As a reminder, the head tag is used for information that we don't directly display on the page, but it's still very important information. Inside of the head, we have one required tag, and that is the title. And the title is the title for the page we are on, and this can be used in a few different places. Most notably, it's used as the name of the tab in your browser. It's also usually used in the name of the pages you looked at in your history, as well as search engines use it for the name that they display in search. Moreover, the title is also used for accessibility sometimes. When somebody using an assistive technology wants to navigate to a new page, they can use the title to get a quick idea of what that page is going to be about. Let's give this a title of meta tags, and then in the browser, you'll see the tab name title updates to reflect the title and the HTML. Now for the majority of the metadata in the head, we will use what's called the meta tag. So I'll go ahead and add one of those here. And inside of this tag, it takes a few different attributes that will determine what data it provides to the browser about this page. So the first one we'll look at is char set or character set. And this is how we determine what is the character encoding of this website. The most common one we'll use here is UTF-8. And UTF-8 is great because it's accepted by pretty much every browser and it also has the characters for almost every language in the world. 
meaning that when you use UTF-8, you don't need to worry about your website not displaying if there's characters from another language. Other than the character set, the majority of the other meta tags will have the exact same attributes. So we'll have a name attribute, and this attribute will be whatever the name of the metadata we want is. So the sort of a key and a key value pair system. And then we have content, and this will be the actual content of that metadata. So for a first one to look at, let's go ahead and look at what is called the viewport. And the viewport is the actual size of the screen. So it allows us to determine how large the window is that the user will be interacting with. And you might be a little bit confused by this as to why we even need that, right? Shouldn't it just be the size of the browser window or the size of the monitor that they're looking at? But that's not always what we want. And the reason for that is primarily related to mobile phones. Since mobile phones are small, they do a few special things to try to display websites in the best way possible. So for example, if you had a phone that had a 640 pixel width, what it might do is sort of pretend to be a larger phone than that, pretend to be like a thousand pixel width, and then it will ask for the thousand pixel width version of the website, and then it will simply scale that down to fit the screen size. The reason they do this is that most websites, when you get smaller than around that size of about a thousand pixels, just don't work very well. They become really hard to read. Everything starts sort of going to new lines way too often and fonts are all over the place. So that's the way that they deal with that. But it makes a bad user experience. I'm sure you've been on your phone on some website and it's super zoomed out and you can't really see anything. The reason for this is that scaling up and scaling back down. So in the case that we have written good CSS that supports mobile devices, we essentially just want to add a meta tag that will disable that artificial scaling that usually happens on mobile phones. And the way we do that is with the viewport meta tag. And inside the content, we will say that we want the width to equal, and we're going to say device width. Essentially, all this says is to use the width of the actual device. We don't want to be doing anything fancy where the device is pretending to be larger than it actually is. And then the last thing we'll do is we'll add a comma. So these values are comma separated and we'll say initial scale. And the initial scale will set equal to one. And what this means is don't try to zoom it in or out. So by default, the mobile phones are going to change their width and then they're going to scale themselves to account for that change in width. So this is simply saying don't change your width and then don't zoom yourself in or out. And we'll go ahead and go to some new lines here just so we can keep all this on one page. And those are the two meta tags that you usually want to be setting. So the character set you almost always want, and you want it to be first because you want the browser to encounter the character set it needs as soon as possible. And then the viewport we'll put right below it once we've written good CSS that supports mobile phones. Now there are a variety of other meta tags that we can add that give extra information to the browser. So we'll go ahead and add a few of those now. We're gonna to go to the bottom of the head. The reason for this is that usually we put the meta tags are sort of less important at the bottom. It's not something you have to do. The order doesn't matter that much, but it is the convention that I think most people tend to prefer because the browser reads from top to bottom. So for example, we want to tell it the character set we're using first, but some of this other information is a little bit less important, so we don't put it at the top. So let's make another meta tag. And for this one, we'll do a name equals author. And what this does is it just allows you to say who wrote the page. So we can say content equals John Doe. So this just says that John Doe was the author of this page. You can think of this like any other document you might write. You would put the author who wrote that document on it. So we do the same thing with HTML, but again, this is optional. You don't need to include this. And along with this, you can also add a description. And the description is a little bit more useful because it gets used in search engines to describe the website. So below the name of the site that you're searching for, it will also usually have a description and that comes from here. So we can say, this is a great website and go ahead and close that out. And the one thing to note about this description, because it is used in the search engine like that, you want to make sure it's not too long. Usually around 150 or 160 characters is the limit you want to go with. Beyond that, you'll start getting the ellipses where the search engine won't display the entire description. So we want to be nice and concise. And there are some other meta tags we could add. For example, keywords used to be something people added all the time, but they tend to be ignored completely by search engines now. So there's not much use in adding keywords anymore. There are also some vendor specific meta tags. So for example, Twitter has some tags that you can use that will tell it when your website is tweeted, 
how exactly to display that on Twitter. But for now, I think this is a great stopping point for the meta tags. These are really all of the core HTML ones that you might want to include. Along with these meta tags, there's some other information that we might want to include in the head. One of those being a favicon, which is the icon for your website. This is used in the tab bar as well as the title to show a little icon for your site. By default, you usually get that little globe icon that we have now, but we can change that to be whatever we want. So we can go ahead and add a link tag, and this is the same tag that we will use to link CSS back into our HTML, but for now we're going to use it for an icon. And the way we do this is we add a rel attribute, so rel, and then we set this equal to icon, and then we set an href, which will be the hypertext reference, so the actual link to the icon. In this case, I have a local file called icon.png, which we can use as our icon. I'll go ahead and save this. And now you can see in the browser we have the new logo right next to the name of the tab we're on. So we have the meta tags tab name, which is from our title. And then to the left of that, we have the icon, which happens to be the algo expert logo in this case. And then finally, one more tag we might want to include is the base tag. And what the base tag does is it sets the base URL for your website. This way, whenever you have a relative link, it will go from that URL rather than just from wherever the server was. We can set an href property here as well, and this will be whatever URL we want to be the base for our relative links. I'll go ahead and use algoexpert.io, and I'll close out this tag. And now whenever we use a relative link, it will start with algoexpert.io rather than just wherever our server is. So for an example, let's come down to the body and add an anchor tag, and we can set this to be a link to slash content. And I will just put the word content inside of it. And now you'll see we get this content text, but if I click on it, it will go ahead and bring us to algoexpert.io and on the content page, rather than just bringing us to slash content in my local directory, which would have gone to a 404 page. Now that's going to be the last tag we'll look at in the head of the HTML. There are plenty others that you can use and experiment with, but I think this should be a great starting point for getting most of the metadata set up for a very well marked up website. And with that, that's going to be the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll see you in the next one.